Hi, welcome to the good side. It's really good to have you here. Before I start this video, I would just like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for not only sticking with me and not leaving my side, but also giving me encouragement during this really hard time in my personal life. Truly, truly, like I have no words. I, I'm still in shock and disbelief. It's hard to believe, but I'm really not all that confident in my real life. So having that support really means a lot to me. So thank you. Since I've gotten quite a few new followers from my uh, very dramatic and viral video, I figure I take the opportunity to reintroduce myself to clear the air in case anyone is watching me and doesn't know who I am and what I'm about. Hi, my name is Ella. I'm a 25 year old glorified internet personality, glorified unemployed individual that somehow got proficient and fluent enough in English that you lovely people on the internet deemed worthy of watching and supporting. So that's what I used to be. And as of today, I have no fucking idea of what my future is going to be like. But hey, I think I have... I have, you know, some idea about the stuff that I want to make. I have some ideas about the projects that I want to make. And I'm grateful to have you guys along with me. And yeah, that's basically the intro to my, to my channel. All right, tension over. Today's topic, if you made it this far, is how I became an updo and somehow garnered over a sizable following. Not a ton, but... Definitely enough that people notice in light of me reaching almost 600k. Well, depending on the time you're watching this, it's probably going to be more. But in light of me reaching, you know, six around 600k followers and me being an up to for almost a thousand days, I figure, you know, I start out my new direction with something not only useful, but kind of near and dear to my heart and something that I definitely have experience in and the way I want to approach this topic today is to tell my story in a chronological way although if you're looking for practical tips stay tuned for my next video I'll share more of the technical side of things ranging from editing and choosing the topics to to film to getting enough confidence to talk into a camera all that kind of stuff I'll probably make it into a series because this is such a complex and multifaceted topic but I've always loved listening to people's stories and I figure for me personally it would be nice to take a trip down the memory lane together and look at some of the hardships that I had to endure and get myself a proverbial pat on the back since I'm going through something severely damaging to my self-esteem lately and by the way that thing that I was talking about in my last video is an internet trolls hating on me I, I don't get a lot of haters these days and even if I do um, I think I've come a long way I've come a long enough way to not even register that like it's not even on my radar at least not anymore just don't worry about me I'll, I'll get through it is what I'm saying my story is kind of long and in order to tick all the boxes of all the shit that I went through and you know to get my point across uh, I have to keep it kind of at that length although I did try my best to keep it at a minimum that said uh, please let me know what part of the story you're more interested in and I'll make it into a separate video just talking about how I got over my fear of rejection my fear of like approaching strangers when I was working my sales job or how I got over my breakup and all that kind of stuff so without further ado let's get right into the meat and the juicy goodness of this video because this video is going to be a little long I would really appreciate it if you would save it for later I know not everyone has the time to watch this entire video in one go now I could start from the very beginning where I started learning English and started getting good at it but that'll just take too long and is probably reserved for another video. For the time being though, let's go all the way back to 2015. By September that year, I had already dropped out of school, gone back to China, got a job, quit the job because my mom and I were finally approved after years of waiting to move to America for good. 
And so I found myself at a crossroad, not being able to commit to anything and honestly not wanting to. I just couldn't do anything substantial other than keeping myself busy with anything I could get my hands on. Um, and it just so happened at the time I was hanging out with my childhood friends and we would play badminton and go out to dinner afterwards. And they would usually just like casually ask me about how I improved my English, how I improved my spoken English especially. And if you've been following me for a while, you know that spoken English is really just that. It's not about your mouth, it's not about your pronunciation, but that's what a lot of people at the time and even to this day still assume, especially when they see someone like me who had gone to America. Although in my defense, it was because my English was proficient enough that I feel comfortable enough and, and competent enough to go to America in the first place. But people just assumed I was going out with foreigners, I was super extroverted or I had some type of superhuman memory. That's why, you know, even before I went to America, I sort of got a decent enough score in IELTS. It wasn't too, too much, but considering I didn't like fully and specifically study for the test, it was impressive enough, at least amongst my peers at the time. And luckily at the time, I didn't have anything better to do. So I found myself naturally wanting to take advantage of that momentum, given that a lot of people were asking me the same thing, but I didn't want to casually give a half as answer or worse answer and then be interrupted halfway through or repeat myself over and over again, even if people were all ears. So writing about it seemed like the right choice. It wasn't like I was trying to get famous or it wasn't like a career move or anything, but it just was my hobby and my desire to do it. You know, why not? Might as well. Cause like I said, I had nothing better to do at that point. I was getting ready to move overseas for good. Long story short, I spent a week or so writing that. Like I would write in between my gym breaks on the notes app on my iPhone, which I still use as my main writing tool to this day. So looking back, I definitely picked up some of my creative habits from even all the way back then. And you know, I just had so much to say that it winded up being a 3000 word essay. Yeah, I was basically telling the story of how I learned English and addressing some of the misconceptions that I hear over and over again. And to my surprise, I guess something about my article just spoke to people. Like I, I sent it to my friends and almost all of them shared it. Even my middle school teacher that taught Chinese, not even English, shared it on her Ponyo Chen, which turned out to be a very lucrative move because by the end of a second, second day or second night, I had already garnered over a thousand or 2000 views or something like that, which is nothing these days, but back then was a lot, especially with me not even having 200 something friends on WeChat. You know, I found myself thinking, oh my God, who are, who are these people? Like, I certainly don't know these people. Where are they? Am I famous now? Am I gonna get recognized if I walk down the street? Like, I still wonder about that. Even though it was definitely a fluke, I still thought to myself, oh, maybe this could turn into something one day. Maybe I could use it as a leverage, as a resume for something later, which did kind of happen. After my article got viral, I stumbled upon this photography slash coffee shop and met the owner who, interestingly enough, would host like talks or salons every now and then. And so I, basically walked up to him and introduced myself and told him that, hey, like I have a thing for English and people seem to like it. Here's how many people that have read my article and maybe you could help me advertise and get my name out there. I'll do this for free. Even though it was a free event, I still worried about whether or not people were gonna show up. Luckily, to my surprise, more than 20 people, I think, more than 20 to 30 people showed up. I remember the owner walking up to me and telling me, hey, you did a good job. Like you did a much better job than I had anticipated because people were paying attention. Nobody was looking at their phone. Nobody wanted to go to the bathroom. Chen Chen Wu Niao Dia was his original words, which I still remember, funny enough. All the, all the things that happened during that time, that was the phrase that I remember even to this day, which I couldn't be more happy about. Yeah, people came up to me after the talk. They asked me for my WeChat and keep in mind, these are all girls. So it wasn't like they were trying to hit on me or had ulterior motives. It just genuinely seemed like I had something valuable to offer them enough so that they wanted to keep in touch with me, which effectively made them my very first followers. That 20 something people felt more significant to me than, you know, 20,000 people later on, which always happens when you're first trying out something like the first group of people that follow you when you have nothing to prove your worth, when you have not even a whole lot of 
body of work. Those people really took a leap of faith on me. And hey, if any of y'all in the audience are still watching me, hi, I'm so glad you stuck around. I'm so grateful to have you along with me on this journey. It's like you've seen me grown up, practically speaking, if you're still watching. And looking back, even though it didn't amount to much, this experience of writing and especially speaking was actually a precursor to my career later on. I just hadn't fully realized it or got determined enough to pursue it full time back then. And technically speaking, my previous experience of waitressing at this super bougie coffee shop also helped because I was interacting with 20 something adults on any given day. Now I was dealing with difficult customers. I would have pretend debates in my head with my boss, with my manager and my boss's boss. By the time I started giving speech or started writing even, I had already sort of had experience dealing with people in a real life scenario. It wasn't like I had gone from, you know, studying in school to directly telling people what to do and giving speeches. I had some work experience, albeit super unrelated to what I'm doing nowadays, but essentially down to the core of it, we're all doing service and waitressing was the most available service out there. Yeah, so I still partially owe my success today to that experience, even with waitressing, which not only gave me the opportunity to talk to people, to approach strangers, but also gave me a sense of marketing because the coffee shop was super bougie and they were taking pictures every single week and promoting different items on the menu. So even back then I had firsthand understanding of just how important aesthetics and marketing in general really are, which I still use in my everyday life, especially on social media. You know, it was tiny success and moments like this that gave me enough of an ego boost to keep me motivated, especially later on when the going gets tough. Surprisingly, or I guess not so surprisingly, moving to a new country wasn't as glamorous or easy as we had thought because it was just me and my mom and money was always tight. In order to survive, I couldn't just pick up my English site hustle thing that wasn't getting me paid or splurge on what I consider to be a very expensive investment, namely a college education, which I understand is an unorthodox and perhaps controversial take on things. And I'm definitely not advocating you do that, obviously. I'm just saying that at least at that time, it was in my best interest not to pursue it because we would have had to take out a loan just for me to go to school when I didn't even know what to study. And I would have been too financially and morally indebted to my mom and too paralyzed to try anything that's a bit out of the norm and risky, which I definitely needed to do later on, in case you haven't noticed. I knew that by me not going to college, I'll be out of my own volition. I practically became a disgrace to the family, which although I couldn't give less of a shit about, was still an understandable disposition on their end. And I didn't want to be a financial burden to anyone in my family. So I've always worked ever since I got here, however miserly I was getting paid. I would work random gigs all while looking for other jobs and reading books on various subjects such as philosophy, dating tips and business tips and, you know, just general topics that you would have had to think about even if you're in college. I know it sounds bad and my mom especially felt bad for me too because people my age were either in school or in grad school to which I just said, you know, even if you can provide for me mom, I'm not going to school like I'm actually loving this. I was in school for two, two and a half years when I was in Seattle and you know for me it was it was enough. It, it was still not the best course of action that I was uh, going for and you know if I later on turn out to be a complete and other failure I could always go back like there's no age limit so that option was always open and I wasn't stupid it just never came to that because my plan was while I still was living with my mom and my expenses were relatively low considering I was living with her rent free and she bought all the food and all the gas and you know miscellaneous items. I'll get paid, go home, and still have enough energy and free time to look into other options and, you know, read and learn things on the side and maybe pick up my side hustle, which I still wasn't too sure about, but I still wanted that option to stay open regardless. So yeah, I was always financially independent or semi-independent. You know, I've always paid for my own shit. If I wanted something, I pay for it. 
just so that I can get my parents off my back for as long as possible while I figure out what I wanted to do with my life, what I'm all about, like who I am as a person. And, you know, me not owing them any money and me kind of still making money enough so to cover my own expenses was buying myself time, which I definitely needed. And since we're on this subject, I don't think anyone at my age then, or even frankly now, because, you know, I'm sort of an anomaly, um, would and should have an, an idea of what they want to do for the foreseeable future. I mean, if you do know what you want to do, good on you, but just know that you're in the minority. And if you don't, you're not a failure, you're not behind anyone, you're just normal. For most people, there's no way to know your future right then and there, or dare to think about your future, especially when so much money and expectation was thrown upon you. It could be a blessing and a curse at the same time to have that much financial support from your parents who typically already had an agenda uh, for what you gotta do for the rest of your life. So naturally, it could feel incredibly paralyzing to make such a decision to not only please your parents, but also please yourself. Ideally, you should be able to please yourself, um, especially when you've lived in an ivory tower your entire life and you've barely had any life experience. If you're lucky, you get to experiment a whole bunch with full support, including emotional and financial support. If you're not so lucky, then you have to make a little detour and most importantly, not be so hard on yourself because this is your life. Just be patient and trust that things will work out in due course of time. For the time being, I'll just note that you're not a failure for not having all the answers, for even failing at many different things, for changing your mind. That's the price of growing up, essentially. I say experiment as much as you can when the stakes are still relatively low and the only people you're disappointing or potentially disappointing are your parents. I mean, if you're afraid of disappointing your parents even in the slightest bit, then I have bad news for you because society, your co-workers, your boss, your managers, your in-laws in the future are gonna be way much more harsh and just unreasonable than your parents. So better start practicing disappointing people and step out of your ivory tower one step at a time. After months of working random gigs, I finally found a job at this printer company. What happened was I had met this manager slash owner of the company who happened to be on a semi long term business trip at a social function and we immediately hit it off. We initially just talked about anything but work ranging from philosophy, life, and why I have tattoos. Yeah, we were friends first. And then one day I just randomly thought to myself, oh, Steven, that's his name. Steven had this company and he needs people. He needs salespeople and I need a job. And it could be a worthwhile investment into learning how to do sales. Um, even if I wasn't particularly interested in printers, I knew that by selling giant ass printers, which is what we sell, it's not like what pedestrians usually would have in their households. It was like printers that print billboard ads and fabric and all that. I knew that at least commission wise, I'll, I'll be compensated pretty well. <laughs> While I was editing this video, I just realized that I had made a YouTube channel and subsequently several YouTube videos from my company. And I guess that also played a part in my career later on. It just you know, it sort of happened organically, but I, <laughs> I laugh at my editing skill back then. Like, take a look at it. Over here, this one with the beanie, that's me. I straight up looked like a dude. <laughs> yeah, that's the printer that we would sell. But I didn't know anything about sales or about the commercial printer industry. I mean, any knowledge that I had about printers, which wasn't even a whole lot to begin with, would make it useless because we were selling giant ass printers. But what I had was my enthusiasm and my, I guess, English skills because we were working with people here in America. So I basically walked up to Steven and negotiated myself a deal. I told him, hey, like, I'll be willing to work for you for free, effectively interning for you, as long as you can teach me about the industry, about sales, as long as you spend time with me. It will kind of be like a mentor 
and apprentice kind of relationship to which he basically said, okay, if you're interested, we happen to have a convention coming up in Las Vegas and you can come with us, we can pay for your stay and you can see what you like or don't like about this job and this industry. Here's another thing, like people couldn't believe that I was able to get a job at a printer company without a degree when in reality a degree isn't the only requirement and sometimes it's not even required especially at a sales job like all you need to do is sell to people i don't even know how a degree especially one that's not in marketing or sales is gonna help that necessarily and oftentimes opportunities are all around us we just have to keep an eye and keep an open mind for them and opportunities often come in the disguise of work which definitely was the case for me because I had to work for them for free. Luckily though, after the convention, I guess because they liked how enthusiastic I was, even though I was completely terrified and didn't know what I was talking about, I at least kept a smiley face and approached people and talked to people willingly and asked my boss questions about printers. So after seeing all that, Stephen, I mean, bless his heart, decided to pay me after all. $2,000 plus commission every month, which wasn't a lot but it wasn't nothing either it was the most money i had ever made at the prime age of 21. for sure it paid me more than all the gigs combined and i didn't even have to work hard labor like i would at a restaurant job and that gave me the time and resources to basically daydream and plan things out in my head looking back even though i wasn't particularly good at sales as in i only sold like three or four printers in my one and a half year working there and you know various different parts like print heads here and there but hey my coworkers also sold about that much so actually let me close the store real quick i think it was the sincerity the integrity the enthusiasm the relentlessness and just trustworthiness that led me to support and patronage from my friend who also was my boss who by the way even years later i've kept in touch with i mean we still occasionally talk about philosophy and i you know crack jokes with him on a regular basis i was grateful not only for the salary the resources but also for what i learned there the way i talk to people the way i talk about myself the way i market myself the way i sell myself the way i always put myself in my customers shoes the power of relentlessness the power of even shamelessness and the power of at times just showing up when you're absolutely terrified and have no idea what you're doing. These are the mindsets that I adopted and still use in my everyday life. But the most important one of them all was probably the power and the importance of marketing. You see, nobody will buy from you if they don't know you and trust you. You can talk all you want, chase them down the streets and offer them lifetime support and top-notch customer service. Nobody gives a shit about all that if they don't find you reliable, trustworthy, and legitimate. And believe me, I learned that lesson the hard way from numerous cold calls to just in your face kind of rejection. The truth is, if you don't have proper branding, it doesn't matter how inexpensive your product is, nobody wants them. As great and exciting and secure as my job was, I decided to quit in September 2017 and gave my own thing a try. Luckily, I had a bit of savings left and it also helped that I was living with my mom rent-free. So maybe don't do what I did because it was definitely semi-impulsive and things could have easily gone terribly wrong. However, I told my mom right as I was about to quit my sales job that she didn't have to worry about me making it or not because i wasn't gonna depend on my dream for survival i was ambitious but i was not delusional i mean i still am not like that i told her that i wasn't gonna be a financial burden to her and i would go work at a restaurant again and scrub toilets if i had to to support myself while i figured this shit out which honestly didn't sound all that bad because i was already doing it kind of in early 2015 and i was good at it I literally thought to myself, you know, it'd be great if I worked at a restaurant. Many actresses or wannabe actresses from Hollywood do that still. And I'll make good money from tips because, you know, I know how to serve. I know how to be a good server. And I even thought to myself, as physically demanding as 
working at a restaurant may be, at least I'll be able to go home and not think about work because back at my sales job, even though I was working pretty much from home and my hours are pretty flexible, I just never knew who would call me and yell at me. As great as it was, I just couldn't think about anything but work. Literally 24 seven, my mind was all about work. But luckily it never came to that. I never had to work at a restaurant, which I still think is a great option if you're absolutely confused about what you're gonna do with your life. It's not something that we should look down on. That being said, I definitely didn't base my decision off of momentary impulses. Well, at least not entirely. Throughout my journey, I've always find little glimpses of hope. For instance, when I talk to friends and colleagues, talks of how to improve English would always come up because they're usually impressed by my English for lack of a better term. And even native speakers sometimes would question, you know, whether or not I was born here and how I got good at speaking. I mean, most people couldn't tell the scope of my fluency and my proficiency beyond the fact that my accent was convincing enough to resemble that of a native speaker. But still, even just that was impressive enough. As much as people are impressed with me, I'd always find myself in a heated debate about how to learn English and how to learn, especially spoken English. And usually the conversation doesn't go so well because one, people don't want to talk about academia at dinner. And two, I never had the time during the debate or even prior to the debate to fully flesh out my arguments. On some level, that frustration motivated me to write more and think about my arguments more extensively later on because I was pretty much having pretend debates with people in my head all the time. And if you think about it, video making later on just makes total sense because you're forced to watch my entire video. You couldn't even interrupt me if you wanted to. The best you could do is like leave the, leave the video. If you did sit through my entire video, if I did my job right, you're forced to see my arguments, you're forced to follow me along, and if I did my job right, you might even start to change your mind, which I think I definitely did. Starting something new is always terrifying, and looking back, honestly, I don't even know if I would have gone to the same lengths that I went to had it not been for my ex-boyfriend's betrayal, which, although it absolutely tore me apart and ripped my heart out, was honestly the fuel and anger that I needed to persevere. And it's not an uncommon phenomenon, it seems. Now, obviously I'm not recommending that you go out there and get yourself heartbroken just so you could succeed in life. All I'm saying is a little setback and frustration and disappointment in life could be an indication that your life is about to turn up, which it definitely did for me. The story of my ex was a bit too long and just meh that I don't even know if I should bring extra attention to it, but I figure it kind of plays a big part in my story, so I'll just say it as. For what it's worth, things were at least tolerable when he was just cheating on me. I mean, without my knowledge, that is. However, the last straw that broke the camel's back was when I decided to teach English after quitting my job. You see, he in his 20s also started an English school of some sort, or rather attempted to start one because ultimately he failed. And seeing me start one again got on his nerves, I guess, because Whenever we talk about, I guess, my language theory or when I try to sound off some ideas about my sales pitch, he would just hit me back with, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Listen to me. I went to college. I majored in psychology or things like that, which I was taken aback by because one, you didn't even major in linguistics. So what are you even talking about? This isn't about psychology. And two, why are you getting all anal on me? Like we're we're trying to work together. Like I'm trying to build this thing with you. Why are you treating me as the enemy? And lastly, my English is better than your Mandarin. Fun fact, he spoke a little Mandarin. I found out later that he learned his Mandarin or got better at his Mandarin by talking to Chinese women on WeChat that he would find randomly because apparently there was a feature that allows you to find strangers on WeChat. And coincidentally, these are all the women that he was cheating on me with. To their credit, they probably didn't know that he had a girlfriend, but a lot of low-class foreigners, a lot of low-class Americans would, would do that sort of thing where they would use like learning a language as a disguise for courting or flirting with women, even if they're already in a relationship or sometimes married. So just so FYI. <laughs> anyway, I guess my business adventures were rather my ambitions at that point because I haven't 
I haven't gotten anywhere. I was just at this point, we're still just talking and daydreaming, you know? He started acting more atrocious and just petty. Like, he was kind of cheating on me silently before, but after I decided I want to go, like, I want to go big or go home, he just started attacking me viciously and started announcing that he was chatting up a storm with random women and making me feel insecure and like a piece of shit. I mean, I'm only laughing about it now because it's been so long and I've done my fair share of healing, but things were absolutely terrible. It got so bad at one time that when we went back to Fuzhou, which is where I'm from, uh, which is, you know, a relatively small town compared to Beijing, Shanghai, that a lot of foreigners don't know about. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe they know about it but it's definitely not on the radar of most people so he somehow by the time we got there had already set up a date so the girl was just like waiting for him to 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 go out together and go on a date together and it it almost seemed like he planned it ahead you know he asked me oh where are you from where are we going and, and then look up girls in this town just so that by the time we get there he'll have something to do well, someone to do. Again, not blaming the girl or anything because she probably didn't know. But whenever I would confront him about who he was seeing and what he was up to, he would hit me back with, oh, I'm just an English teacher. Like, I'm practicing my Mandarin with the, these people. I'm teaching them English at the same time. Like, why are you so jealous? Why are you so petty? Why don't you trust me? And, you know, I'm a better English teacher than you are. Which really got on my nerves because he was using my skills he was using my expertise as a weapon against my relationship insecurities so naturally i wanted to destroy him not like physically or even to retaliate like i didn't launch a smear campaign against him i mean i kind of am now but like you don't know who he is i just wanted to destroy him in my head as in like i want to be i want to be the popular Chinese girl you know I'm not a native speaker I'm not particularly sexy or good looking at least at that time I wasn't good looking like I mean I definitely look better now and more presentable now but back then I was literally a nobody I wasn't particularly popular I mean I still at that point had like two or three hundred people on my WeChat and somehow as petty as it sounds that anger and jealousy not because like I was jealous of those girls but jealous that you know, he kind of had a natural advantage over me because he was a native speaker. So that anger and jealousy kind of catapulted me into just determination. Like, I literally thought to myself, I will one day be more popular than you could ever dream of and garnered over more female fans than you could ever dream of, which I don't mean to brag, but... I definitely have a lot of girlfriends. Obviously, I don't care about him or even hate him for that matter. But I'm just saying that's what truthfully happened. Um, your pain, your heartbreak, as cliche as it sounds, shape who you are for better or worse. If my experience with sales, marketing, writing, speaking before kind of inspired me to go down this rabbit hole, my ex's betrayal and constant disrespect and belittling actually sealed the deal for me as in I literally thought to myself I will not stop I will not stop until one day I can prove to him that I was better than him all along I think my suffering and my determination somehow moved the universe or this higher being above whatever you want to call it to get me connected to my tutoring gigs which paid me more than my last job and also gave me more time and freedom so in that free time i started to make videos not because i wanted to be famous but just as a backup material to hand out to people when i approach strangers on the street because in the past where i attempted to market myself i had trouble selling not only my service but this unconventional approach that i have in regards to language learning in case you haven't noticed, I have to make a case of why this approach that I'm preaching, regardless of who's teaching it, is guaranteed to work. Instead of me repeating myself over and over again, having them watch and read my stuff, frankly, 
would be more beneficial to them and to myself because I've spent less time and convey more information. However, my early success and language skills and persuasion skills aside, I didn't start my video making career without the rocky start. Months would go by before my videos would gain any traction. And trust me, those months felt like years. I was desperate too. I had already quit my job. And even though I lent myself a gig that paid me more than that job, it wasn't a career move. It wasn't sustainable. I didn't know where my money would come from even a year from that point. I had invested all this money into filming gear and all this time into learning and researching anything from how to design a thumbnail to how to talk into a camera to what topics to talk about. And even after all that, my videos would get 10, 20 views. And that's after a week or so. Looking back now, I understood exactly what went wrong from the platform that I picked to the way I presented myself to the cadence with which I spoke. I mean, everything was just amateur and unwatchable, understandably. But I never would have figured all that out had I not gone through the initial trial and error phase. Had I entertained even just one iota of doubt in myself, I would have stopped right there. And many people do stop right there. Luckily, I had developed a thick skin from my last job, so I wasn't particularly concerned with what I looked like, which was not that good, both literally and figuratively. Like my face sometimes was so bloated and so poorly positioned in the frame that it would just take up the whole frame and I look just horrible and unpresentable. And anyone in their right mind would look at me and think, like, what are you doing with your life? Have you no self-respect? And I was not oblivious. I just had other stuff to worry about. It wasn't like I was fearless or completely unfazed. I just couldn't bother thinking about anything else. My mental chatter around that time was, this is literally it. It's the easiest way and perhaps the only way to get my name out there. And make no mistake, I wasn't even counting on getting famous at that point. I was just literally thinking to myself, I gotta make stuff and then I can show it to my potential clients and establish my authority my trustworthiness and I thought to myself as long as I can support myself as long as I have the time to make videos I'll just keep going yeah there were no signs of success and the only silver lining was that I still wanted to do it regardless and I know that if it's going to be difficult for me it's going to be difficult for just about anyone else and I guess I just had so much to say that I literally settled for talking to myself like the crazy person that I was that I still am. You see, in my head, not only could I not afford to give up, I also felt responsible for my dream, the same way that a parent would feel responsible for a child. And instead of asking my dream for something that I want, I wanted to provide for it. I wanted to feed it properly. And because of that, I started seeing difficulty and hardships as challenges, as these puzzle pieces ready to be pieced back together. And instead of me feeling sorry for myself, I was just constantly solving problems in my head. For instance, one time I got creatively frustrated and scared about what I had to say and whether or not what I had to say was valuable. And during that time, I stumbled upon a magazine advertisement for a book writing workshop slash retreat where we would go to basically out into nature and stay at a fancy retreat center with like nice hotel rooms and do nothing but write for three, three or four days. Yeah. I mean, granted, the workshop was made for people who want to write and finish a book, but I figure, you know, the same principles could be applied to making videos, namely writing video scripts. It's funny to think that me, still with no following at this point, had the audacity to attend such a workshop for writers like I'm some big shot author which I still am not. In my defense though, I had already gathered a bunch of ideas in my head, or sometimes on paper, that were just too random and unorganized and I never quite felt confident enough to share them. So that workshop along with so many books and courses that I signed up for really gave me the confidence and competence to start sharing my ideas shamelessly. By me investing in such a thing, I was investing in myself, I was investing in my dream, and what naturally followed was a mindset shift. I found myself sitting with my ideas longer, being more attentive and patient with them, tweaking them to my liking, and just overall feeling appreciative and grateful for them. 
and not dreading sharing them with the world. Because I allowed myself to attend this workshop, I had gone from a hobbyist to a careerist. It's like suddenly I just decided with no one's approval or blessing that I wanted to make videos and make content in general for a living. And years later, thanks to my perseverance and really just passion, I never stopped creating content, some of which got viral, most of which didn't. But that's not in my control nor my desire. That's not the reason I started making it to begin with. I mean, of course, if I get successful, that'll, that'll help me pay the bills, that'll help me keep this thing going, but I wasn't counting on it. Which ironically helped because otherwise people could smell your desperation from a mile away. So yeah, that was my story leading up to my TikTok success slash sensation. I mean, it's gone down quite a bit, but you already know the story afterwards and... I haven't been doing anything different since day one. It's just now I speak with more conviction. I know more about the technical side of things. I feel more comfortable and confident. But it's not that different from what I was already doing before I got quote unquote famous. But yeah, that is it. That is my story. I um, will continue to make stuff that I want to make. I will continue making content. This is my life and I'm not suggesting that everybody do the same thing and I'm not even suggesting I'm a success. Um, if anything, it's a story about pain, it's a story about being lost, it's a story about being heartbroken and finding yourself after being heartbroken. It's a story about stepping your stepping out of your comfort zone one step at a time and just taking the initiative to do things that you normally wouldn't think of. And just trusting your intuition and trusting that things will work out in due course of time. And treating obstacles and hardships as puzzle pieces and challenges and make it fun for yourself. I really hope that I didn't come across as this snob that's parading her success in front of everyone's face. That's not my intention, nor what I think of myself. My intention is that after seeing someone like me, it will ease your anxiety a little bit. I hope it will give you hope. Let me know what you think of the story. Let me know what what part of it resonated with you or what part of it you don't agree with. I'm sure I'll get comments about me dropping out of school or me, like my family and stuff like that. But you know, that's, that's life. You're not gonna get people agreeing with you all the time. And that's not why I wanted to share my story at all. But let me know if you want to find out more about the specific parts of the story and I'll make another video I'll make it into another video for sure. No problem. I got you covered. And I really hope that you're you're liking this new direction that I'm going in. And I'll see you next time. Bye. I don't know if you guys can hear, but there is a space heater right behind me. I'm currently staying in a cabin on a camping site with all of my shit. <laughs> it started snowing earlier. I've been spending time alone out in nature. Like when I'm spending time alone, I get the most inspiration and it's not like I have anything better to do today. I feel inspired in the moment and I don't want my inspiration to run away.